China's President Xi Jinping will open the Ninth Forum on China-Africa Cooperation Summit, urging African leaders to import more Chinese goods in exchange for loans and investments. The three-day forum will set the framework for China-Africa relations until 2027, with a focus on green technologies, technology transfer, and people-to-people -people exchanges. China may also increase credit lines to African central banks and businesses. African leaders grappling with debt crisis seek quicker financing solutions, job-creating investments, and better terms for agricultural exports. Delegates will push for assurances on China's $300 billion African goods pledge from the 2021 summit and explore reducing trade deficits. Well, joining me for more on this, I have Professor Exxon Iraqi, who is an economist at the University of Nairobi. Thank you, Professor, for joining me today. Mm, hello, good afternoon. Great. I guess it's afternoon over there. <laughs> good to have you. There it is. Yes. We're seeing China continue to befriend Africa, even as it has a silent face-off with Western countries. Uh, what do you make of this? It's, it's interesting that uh, China and the U.S. have been competitors, not just politically, but also economically. And it appears each of them had been wooing African countries. I think 2021-22, I think U.S. hosted African leaders in Washington, D.C., and now China is hosting African countries in Beijing. So I think there's a contest to see who is going to get more influence by Africa, between US and between China. And I think that's the advantage African countries will take advantage, should take advantage of, help them get the best out of each, each of these superpowers. They can contest, but we gain from that. But are we doing that yet? I don't think we are doing that. I don't think we have been very good negotiators. In my opinion, we have not get the we have not got, got the best out of the two countries. If you look at the data that is being provided, you find that we have a trade surplus. China has a trade surplus with Africa. US has a trade surplus with Africa. European Union has a trade surplus with Africa. So I think we should need we need to go beyond aid, beyond development assistance, so that we export enough to have a surprise ourselves, and that is going to make a difference in building, in, in coming up with jobs and uh, upgrading the rebate standards of Africans. Well, just turning a bit into geopolitics, uh, all of this actually gets geared towards entrenching uh, China's status as superpower. Is that what China is trying to do with Africa? I think China will never say openly that they are trying to become a superpower by entrenching their interest in Africa. If you talk to the Chinese diplomats, Chinese uh, investors, they are saying they are looking for a win-win situation, that Africa develops, but also China develops. And I think that's what the West has been saying for the last 60 years, that we are trying to develop Africa. And as an economist, what I'm looking forward is to see whether China will do better than the Western countries in developing Africa, in making sure that China benefits Africa benefits, and there's a win-win situation. That's what all of us are doing for it. Well, agreements in past summits have unlocked you know, unrivaled access to Africa's raw material markets for Beijing, as well as investment dollars for African countries. Now, this summit will not be an exception. And we're talking about improved access to minerals like lithium, copper, cobalt, and a lot of all of that. But at what expense is this happening? That, that's what worries me because Africa exports raw materials, whether it is lithium, whether it is uh, trees, whether it is gold. We love exporting raw materials, whether it is coffee or tea. And I think at the time Africa insisted that we need to export value added materials. You get more value, you get more money. The other approach Africa needs to use is to, use it to do exactly what China did. If you look at the growth of China in the last 50 years, China has been telling Western countries, US, Japan, Korea, come and invest in China. So I think we need to have Chinese companies come and invest in Africa, the same way I've seen Toyota investing in the US, so that the jobs are created here, the value addition is, 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 is done in, Africa, in African countries, and we get more value for our resources. That is the approach we should use. But why is that not happening right now? Is it that our leaders are not probably putting that option on the table? Or is it that Africa probably does not have the infrastructure for um, China to come build these super companies here? I think there are two things that are missing. One of them is technology. We don't have a critical pass, a critical number of Africans who are trained in such technology, manufacturing, and all that you need to do the manufacturing. 
So we need people who have the basic skills in science, in technology, in supply chain management, and so on. And I think the other missing ingredient, in my opinion, is that we are missing self-confidence. We don't believe that we can be good as the Chinese, we can be good as the Indians, we can be good as Western Europeans or Americans. If you bring technology, you bring self-confidence, there's no reason why Africa cannot do what the rest of the world is doing. Well, talking about, you know, there's no reason why Africa would not be able to do what the rest of the world is doing. We know that Africa is sort of importing, you know, China-made products, particularly renewable energy products and some other things. But then when you look at the crude or the raw materials that are used for these things, they are from Africa, actually, at the end of the day. What stops Africa? Why isn't Africa doing enough to also create value for these things and not just export them? What is the challenge, really? Well, you know, the challenge is very simple, that for the last 60 or 70 years, we have been using imported technology. And once you use imported technology, imported science, you not get all that you want. Remember, some of the technology that we use is protected by patents, is protected by secrets. So we cannot be able to use it as appropriately as the owners. And that's why I'm saying Africa must start homegrown technology, homegrown science, to take advantage of their resources you take advantage of what they produce, agriculture, minerals, and so on. I'm fascinated when you go to the U.S., you can go to a, a, a school like the Corando School of Mines. If you go to, to, to Scotland, you can do a bus, Bachelor of Science in brewing because brewing is their main industry. If you go to Australia, you can get a degree in mining. So Africa does have, has a lot of minerals. So we need to start coming up with the skills that can help us improve our mining, our agriculture, and exploit all the resources that we have here instead of relying on foreign technology. So what's your expectation from this ongoing summit? What do you think Africa should say? What should Africa request? I think Africa should make a very simple request that this forum should be a win-win situation. China should open her markets so that we can export more. But in the long run, I want to see more technology transfer so that we get more technology to exploit our resources. I also want more trade so that Africa does not develop dependency on China just the same way we develop dependency on the Western countries. It should be a win-win situation. Well, you talked about the trade surplus and then, of course, the deficits for Africa. How can Africa actually turn the tide? Is it possible? What are the steps that Africa must put forward? Do we need maybe a regional approach to achieving this? I think region approach is one of the ideas so that I don't negotiate with China as Kenya or as Nigeria. We can negotiate through ECOWAS. We can negotiate through East African community. We can nego negotiate as African Union. Because if we are more, then we bargain, we, we bargain more. But if we bargain as individual countries, I don't think we are going to, be, to get uh, the best deals. And number two, I think we have not been very good negotiators. I'll keep on saying that. If you look at Americans and the European negotiating, or American and Chinese negotiating. They come up with very good trade deals. So let's have to negotiate with others so that we get the best out of any deal. Well, talk to us. You're in Kenya. Tell us about, you know, the Kenyan story. What are your expectations from your president? Uh, there has been a lot of great expectations. Actually, when the president was leaving, he said he is going to come up with some deals. Uh, one of them that we expect is a new road uh, that is going to link Nairobi to the western part of the country. There have been reports in the media that it has been given to a Chinese consortium to construct it so that we can get better connection to Uganda, Rwanda, and northern Tanzania. We are also hoping that in, through the negotiations, Kenya might get some, some debt relief. Remember, Kenya has some uh, debts to China that has accumulated for the last few years. So maybe that debt should be rescheduled or maybe get some debt, debt relief. There are a lot of great expectations that uh, the president, when he's coming home, will come home with some goodies. But we can just wait and see. Well, you know, there have been some criticism against China, saying that it's luring African countries into, you know, some sort of debts that are not sustainable. Should we blame China for that? All the African countries who are taking these debts, didn't they think about the sustainability before taking them on? I'm just wondering, because you talked about how that Kenya is also hoping that there will be some restructuring or something done to their own debt. When it comes to debt, uh, we are to blame because that debt is not forced on us using a gun. We negotiate. We know the terms. We know the conditions. We agree. So. We should not blame the person giving us the money because we accept it voluntarily. 
what we need to know, what, what we need to know is to do is to make sure that any loan we get from China or European Union or US is put to the right use. Because people don't get debt for the purpose of just getting it. It's supposed to create the product, to improve the productive capacity of the country so that the country improves, the country, the country becomes more productive and the economy expands. If we do that, I think I have no problem with getting debt from wherever we get it. Because even as individuals, we get debt and we put it in the right use. And that's the approach as African countries we should use. Well, we know China's position as Africa's biggest lender, but then looking at all of that, are there actual gray areas? I understand, you know, you talked about how that it's the fault of Africa. Africa has to also, you know, look at the books and all of that before getting into that agreement. But are there also gray areas, something we need to pay attention to in all of this? It is interesting you asked that question because when President Ruto was campaigning to become the president in 2022, he raised the issue of Chinese loans and Chinese debts that are not transparent. He said if you compare the debts and the loans we get from China, the contracts are not as transparent as what we get from the West. So maybe in our negotiation with China, whatever we negotiate with China should be public. So the voters, the taxpayers can question that and come for better deals. And I think that has been one area that people have been raising, that the Chinese terms of loans, Chinese terms of debts have not been as transparent as expected. If that was done, I think that would, would, would be a good way to get better deals. Well, another area to probably look at is China's decreasing lending to the continent. Uh, what do you make of it? Because I've seen a lot of analysts talking about that, that China is beginning to you know, decrease its lending to the continent. What does that even say? I think there, there, could, there could be two reasons why that has happened. I think China has been uh, talking of small is beautiful. So that instead of having big projects, you have small projects that are very impactful. So probably by having small projects that are impactful, China can be able to lead more projects in more African countries and probably have a bigger impact on the continent. And the other reason why that is decreasing could be that uh, African countries have not been putting that money to the right use. I've seen the Western countries reducing their lending to Africa for the same reason, that the money is not put to the right use. And finally, for China, it might be that after COVID-19, the economy did not grow as fast as expected there could have been less money available for lending for African countries. Now, you know, that last one you said sounds more like it. I, I feel that's what it is. But then, uh, let, let's close on these. There have been concerns raised about, you know, unsustainable practices such as illegal logging in several African countries that contribute to the markets in China. And we also have a U.S.-based EIA report that, you know, uh, talked about illegal timber transports from Mozambique to China surging since 2017 and saying that the funds were also going to armed groups contributing to an insurgency in the country. That's according to that report that was done by IEA. So talk to me, is this something to be worried about? Or can it be dismissed as one of those silent face-off, you know, between the West and China? If you remember during the Cold War, the, the two countries, the, the old Soviet Union and the U.S., used to fight proxy wars. And some of those proxy wars were fought in Africa. And most of the proxy wars were fought where there were minerals, where there were resources. So I think the contest between the U.S. and China should not be on the African continent. We are going to be the collateral damage. So whether it is logging, whether, whether it is oil, it should be done transparently. So that if you come and you want to exploit oil in Kenya or Kiba in Mozambique, wherever it is, should be done transparently to benefit the local people, not to develop the people who are interested in those minerals. So I, I think I, I want all African deals, all African commercial transactions should be above the border. It does not matter whether it is between African countries or between African superpowers. That is the only way African citizens are going to benefit from their, from their minerals and improve their living standards. That's the dream of every child in Africa. Let's close on this. What's your thought really on the state that Africa is in at this point in time? What are the major issues? What are the challenges? We talked about it. We have the resources, a lot of them, human, natural, whatever you call it, you know, name it, we have all of this. Yet, there seems to be a problem. We've had, or we have so many presidents, so many leaders promising things, you know, during pre-election period. And at the end of the, day, of the day, it feels like these things are difficult to achieve. What is the problem with the black man? What is the challenge in Africa? <laughs> I think that's, that's a very hard question, but a very simple question. If you talk to people in Nigerian rural areas, in Kenyan rural areas, in every African rural areas, they'll tell you they are waiting for the government to transform their lives. 
But then we, when you talk to the government, they tell you, I'm waiting for China, I'm waiting for the US, I'm waiting for European Union to help us transform the continent. So as individuals, we are waiting for the government, the government is waiting for the development partners or to get money from elsewhere. So by that waiting, a lot of responsibility gets, uh, a lot of responsibility disappears. So what we need to do trans to transform Africa is to realize that Africa will not be transformed by the Westerners, it will not be transformed by the Chinese, it will be transformed by ourselves. So that we start breathing in hard work, we start breathing in technology, we start breathing in our future. Because the more we wait for other food transport to transform Africa, the longer we wait. Remember Chinese, remember American, Europeans and the rest have their strategic interests. Let Africa define her strategic interests and pursue them. And remember, charity starts at home. It's not going to change. Even Chinese, Americans, Europeans, charity starts at home. In Africa, it must also start at home. Well, what do you make of conspiracy theories about how that these other countries are probably, in one way or the other, you know, be, sort of behind what's happening in Africa? I mean, we hear a lot of that and we're wondering, can't that be true? What do you make of it? How they're remote controlling and maybe removing somebody if the person tries to do the right thing or tries to say, you know, go away or something to them? What do you make of these conspiracies? Are there really something to pay attention to? I, I think I hear conspiracy theories everywhere that, uh, Af that the, the West and developed Africa. And I'm sure you have already heard the other conspiracies, conspiracy theory that China wants to start up Africa with the debt so that it does not develop. So there might be some truth in conspiracy theories. But at the end of the day, Africa will not develop because of conspiracy theories. It will develop because of breathing itself, doing the right thing, reducing corruption, bringing in the future, coming, coming up with the African dream. And I'll give you a good example about America. America was one time a British colony, but you never hear Americans talk about colonialism. They moved on. So even in Africa, we need to go beyond, beyond conspiracy theories, beyond blaming others. And we take up responsibility. Because as you said earlier, we have the resources, we have the human capital, we have everything that we need to turn this continent around. And I think it's the time we stop complaining and move on. We have everything that we need. African Union, East African community, ECOWAS. We have everything that is needed. What is needed is simply the turning point. We believe in ourselves and move on. Professor Exen Iraqi, economist, University of Nairobi, thank you for your time and your thoughts on Business Edge today. Thank you and have a good afternoon.